It's my pleasure to open the series of talks, and I want to start with the role and the issues around blood transfusion and anemia management, not only in Europe, but also in Australia for some very specific reasons. Um, let's start with variability of transfusion rates in Europe. You have on the uh, left-hand side Denmark with about 65 transfusions per thousand population. On the right-hand side, Romania. So the um, blood, bloodthirsty Vikings take about four times as many units as Romania. What you see is clearly a large variability. And um, <clears throat> we also looked into one country, Aus Austria, uh, with the Austin Benchmark study. We randomized uh, 18 public institutions out of 220, and we enrolled 3,600 patients, and we wanted to see what is the current transfusion rate by institution for matched patients in elective surgery. Um, it was orthopedic surgery, it was um, um, cardiac uh, bypass graft, uh, arterial bypass graft. And what we could see is that 97% of all transfusions could have been predicted by, first of all, the level of anemia prior to surgery. Was there an anemia? Was it detected? Was it treated? Yes or no? This was, had a major impact on transfusion rates. Then, of course, the volume of perioperative blood loss. Were there any systematic um, efforts to control the blood loss and to minimize the bleeding, yes or no? And finally, of course, the transfusion trigger. Was there a restrictive or a more liberal trigger? And uh, here are some of the results with 1,400 total hip replacements. As I said, match patients in these 16 out of 18 institutions. And the institution number 15 on the left-hand side had transfusion rate of about 14%, uh, then on the right-hand side, uh, center number, number 10, about 84%. So when you send grandma to this number 15, her chances to get a transfusion for the same operation, for the same intervention, is about one-sixth of uh, the chances to get a transfusion in center number 10. And we can see this pattern for all sorts of orthopedic uh, interventions. We saw it for the cardiac patients. And of course, this is only one paper which um, retells the same story because we had this, uh, uh, we had several um, studies in Europe, the Sanguis study, the Biomed study, which showed over years that there is just this pattern, that there are huge, um, um, there's a, a, a huge a very, uh, transfusion rate uh, variability. So if you, for instance, take the first five and say, okay, let's say this is an acceptable transfusion rate, then you can clearly see there's a huge potential for reduction. We also uh, uh, try to quantify the effect of the uh, pre-op anemia, and you see here again these uh, 3,600 patients, cabbage, hemicolectomy, total hip replacement, total knee replacement. And um, the Romans 1 group is the one uh, of the non-anemic patients prior to surgery, and Romans 2 is the anemic group. And you can see that uh, the non-anemic group received 32% um, of the transfusions, and this one, 62% of patients received the, trans <coughs> the transfusion. So there is obviously an impact, um, whether you correct it or not prior to surgery. Now, is, is anemia something we can accept? Is it an innocent bystander? Well, there are several um, articles showing that anemia is a, a serious problem. By the way, the World Health Report says there are three billion people anemic in the world. Half the world's population is anemic, of course, um, largely due to uh, nutritional deficiencies. And uh, here it says closing in on a killer anemia in elderly people, or a public health crisis. Um, <clears throat> here you see the growing burden of anemia as our patients getting older and older. In 1987, 
Um, we had um, admission hemoglobins for these CHF patients. It's a Meyer Clinic uh, paper, as you can see, of about 12.2 um, grams uh, of hemoglobin per deciliter. And uh, in 1999, we look at about 11.7. So there is a downwards trend because the population is getting older and is um, making a larger and larger part in human society as a segment, a socioeconomic segment. What is the prevalence uh, of anemia in critically ill patients? Here are different cutoff points. The papers by Vincent and von Asen. They show you that um, they range between, if we define it by less than 10 grams, 29% of these patients are anemic. If you define it by 12 as a cutoff point of the WHO, 12 or 13, depending on the gender, 63%, uh, the Van Asen paper with a cutoff of 11 grams per day, so it is 77%. Here, another paper which looks uh, into a different patient population, the cancer population, according to Knight, th 30 to 90% of these patients are anemic. Um, another selection or a compilation of papers um, by, by different uh, viewpoints, you can see it is, it is a large portion of the patient population. And here, again, the addressing the question if it's an innocent bystander anemia, can it be just you know, accepted, tolerated? You have in this first line uh, the relative risk of a two-year mortality in non-anemic patients, the baseline, the relative risk of one. Now, if you add anemia only, then it goes up to 1.9, or if you look at uh, chronic uh, patients with uh, chronic disease only, 2.05, but chronic disease and anemia, 3.37. Or if you look at um, anemia and uh, heart failure only, 286, but if you add anemia to the heart failure, 378. And if you combine all together, it's a um, relative risk of 6.07. So <clears throat> there is obviously a problem that has been uh, largely ignored in the past. And um, there is one here, here, by the way, the cutoff points uh, due to the WHO definition of anemia. And um, you can see these distributions that, of course, the female population is um, much, much closer or has much more anemic uh, patients than the male one. And uh, here again, looking into different age groups, as we said before, with the CHF, uh, CHF um, uh, patients, that as our population of patients gets older, we see more anemic patients. And here you have another way to look at it from this paper, um, or the data I've reproduced from Coolia and Grombots recently. So, <clears throat> what's the consequence? And I want to look now into Australia. They uh, the Department of Health of Western Australia kicked off a patient blood management program and decided to implement this first time ever statewide for all patients and for all public institutions, including some private institutions. But the health system, Western Australia, is basically run by, um, in the, by the public system. So <clears throat> what is patient blood management? There is one of several possible definitions. We think uh, patient blood management is the application of evidence-based medical and surgical concepts aimed at relying on the patient's own blood rather than on donor blood. And uh, it's based on three pillars. The first pillar is the optimization of the hemopoiesis. The second pillar is the minimization of blood loss and bleeding. And the third one is harnessing and optimizing the tolerance of anemia. And of course, this is a multidisciplinary um, approach. You cannot delegate it just to the Department of Anesthesiology or say, well, this is the issue of the uh, hematology department. There are many disciplines involved, and it needs uh, 
a very tight cooperation of all these departments involved. If you break it down, these three pillars, by a pre-op and an intra-op and a post-op phase, then you have a nine-field matrix with a lot of modalities um, contributing to this uh, overall concept of patient blood management. And when you look at just uh, some of these, like um, detecting the anemia, identifying the underlying disorder, uh, which is causing the anemia, you correct it, um, you start uh, with uh, iron treatment, uh, erythropoietic uh, stimulating agents, vitamin B12, folic acid, and if you um, continue to stimulate the erythropoiesis after the intervention, well, we would call this um, major elements of anemia management. So anemia management is one integral part of the overarching patient blood management concept. And uh, the government of Western Australia decided, and here's the, uh, the, the front page of the executive summary um, of the Department of Health, they decided um, to implement it based on four rationales. Said number or four reasons. Number one, we have supply issues, and the whole Western world is running into supply issues more and more as the population is getting older. The other one is the cost of blood. Many think blood is free, but in fact it's paid somewhere, and if it's only the taxpayer, but it's being paid for, and I want to show you in a moment how much society is paying for blood. And then, of course, we have this enormous transfusion practice variability. We have it when we come to my second slide, I think, if we compare it on a country-to-country -country basis. But, of course, you also have these huge variabilities between institutions, as we showed in the Austin Benchmark study. And uh, you have a huge variability between practitioners or physicians or surgeons, whatever. And uh, finally, transfusion safety and effectiveness. So these are the reasons why the government in Western Australia said there is a need for change, there is the need to um, shift the paradigm. And I want to run through these five drivers of patient blood management very quickly, and want to start with the supply issues. What you see here is, and this is kind of generic for almost all developed um, Western economies, the growth rates of the population by different age segments. On the left side, you have neonates to 40 years of age, and uh, the blue bars are the 10-year growth <coughs> retrospect. Uh, the red bars are the last 10 years and the next 10 years, so 20 years growth rate. And you can see that the, the, young, the young age segment is just growing by about 15% over 20 years. But the old age segment is growing by 75% in the same, during the same period of time span. According to the intergenerational report of the Commonwealth of Australia's, uh, of Australia's Treasurer um, Office says that real-term health spending on the, old age, on, the, on the old age segment from, from 2009 to 2049 will multiply between 7 and 12 times. This is real-term spending. This is not just uh, spending um, due to inflation rates. So this is a real, a real concern. Now, <clears throat> we know that this is a problem in the entire field of healthcare, but there's a special problem related to transfusion because blood, of course, has to be sourced from your population. So the population is shrinking. There's more users uh, and less donors, and we call this the um, transfusion dependency ratio, and there's also a formula to quantify that. So on the supply side, you're having a problem, but what is overlooked in many cases is the demand side of things, because if you ask how much blood do these segments, age segments, consume annually per, <coughs> per thousand population, um, and this first segment is about 11 units per 1,000. In this segment, it's about 30 units per 1,000. But in this segment, it's 180. And this is, as I said, the, 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 the steeply growing segment, which is multiplying by 7, probably by 12, within the next 40 years. <clears throat> 
yeah, 40 years. So there's a leveraged demand for blood components and a shrinking donor base. And this causes problems. The next aspect was the cost of transfusion. Well, we have a price tag in most countries on red cell units and all the other um, blood components. In some countries, I sometimes hear, well, they are free. People don't even know in the institution how much um, a, a bag of blood would cost. But here we have two hospitals in the US, Inglewood Hospital Medical Center and um, uh, Rhode Island Hospital. And uh, then we have the uh, Schiff in Lausanne and the General Hospital in Linz. So these red bars you can see is the price or the cost for one unit of red cells when it hits the doorsteps of the hospital, between $260 and $169 per unit. But uh, along with this transfusion service, with all the uh, pre-transfusion testing, with the logistics, and uh, with the actual transfusion of the blood into the veins of the patient, which is to be monitored by a nurse in some countries, by law, by the anesthetist or another physician. And uh, with the aftercare and everything involved, we did the process cost analysis. We, we really counted every single element in terms of um, personnel being used, uh, labor cost, material cost, third-party cost, finance cost, and we found out that the cost of getting this one unit into the veins of a patient is between $1,183 and about $500. But of course, it's not a single unit transfusion. It's in the surgical arena, a transfusion rate of, let's say, three to four units per surgical transfused patient. Now, we use the actual transfusion rate of every of these institutions, institutions and multiplied it with the process cost, with the blue bar, and then you come to these numbers. Between $3,500 and $2,000, just transfusion-related cost. So the um, next question, of course, is what about the cost of transfusion-related adverse outcome? I know that this is really the debate about um, outcome, uh, which we will go through during this uh, um, conference today. But I think this is a very interesting paper that sets the tone. Um, this is a retrospective cohort study with quite a large sample size. It's 38.6 million American patients. And 5.8% of these patients, 2.33 million, have been looked at uh, in comparison to the, to the total in terms of um, the impact of transfusion. And after adjustment for age, gender, and comorbidities, admission type or DRG, transfusion was associated with a 70% increase um, of uh, mortality, a 90% increase of infection, and the average length of stay was about 2.5 days longer. And the charges were $17,200 more per transfused patient. Of course, we have to discuss how much of this is causal, how much of this is really attributable to a transfusion. But you will see that there are a lot of arguments for it. Anyway, if you multiply this, you come to a total burden just for the US of $40 billion. And this is uh, a macroeconomic dimension. The next issue is the constant safety issue. There is a risk. We know this historically. And every time when there was a new test added to um, make blood safe, because the mantra is blood safer than it's ever been, we always had an increment in cost. And uh, the green line, for instance, shows you when um, uh, the uh, leukodepletion depletion was introduced into the system, and that made already an 80% cost increase per unit. So we know that it's safe in terms of HIV and Hep C and Hepatitis B, of course, only in the developed world, and at enormous cost, by the way. The cost for net testing of um, 
red blood cells is estimated to be 5.8 to 8.2 million dollars per quality adjusted life here. We know that the quality threshold in public health decision making is about $50,000. And here we talk of 5.8 to 8.2 million. It's about 116 to 168 times the threshold. So we know that we somehow have lost the plot in terms of um, optimal resource allocation. But then there are other emerging infectious agents in this paper by Stramer, um, published in connection with the um, Center of Disease Control in Atlanta, says here are the emerging infectious agents with the potential for severe clinical outcome. There's another group that might support elevation to a higher priority in the future, and chikungunya, for instance, in Australia has already moved up to this highest level of concern. Then there is a group which carries public and or regulatory concern, according to this paper. And you can see there is a new form of prions already detected, chronic wasting disease. And then there is a watch list subject to modification as circumstances change. So we constantly see new pathogens coming up. We identify new ones. We still don't know what they mean, what, kinds of, what kind of a threat they represent to the public, but they are out there. And the International Consensus Conference on Transfusion and Outcomes, um, you will see publications coming out uh, in 2011 on this. We looked at transfusion and outcome in observational studies with sample sizes more than 10,000, and we could see that the majority of these 300,000 patients showed that transfusion is associated with adverse outcome. Then we looked at studies with sample sizes less than 10,000, and we have exactly the same picture. The majority, the large majority of studies showed transfusions associated with adverse outcome. Um, in this paper here about patient blood management, we looked at the different endpoints in terms of uh, reported adverse outcome. And you see infection, septicemia, but you also see myocardial infarction. So instead of um, avoiding ischemic events, you obviously have more ischemic events, which is uh, an interesting question for the physiologists, I think. Um, and then these were the patient populations covered by these more than 600,000 patients we looked at in these 222 studies. Here is uh, one uh, looking at the cancer population called rectal cancer. The Cochrane analysis by Amato, you might be familiar with it, it says, um, the pooled estimates of periop blood transfusion effect on colorectal cancer recurrence is about 40% more than on the non-transfused. And this is always in a dose-dependent relationship, by the way. Uh, this um, large uh, retrospective uh, cohort study with half a million patients in the United States um, by Corona et al. shows that um, mortality and also um, thrombotic embolism and uh, arterial embolism adverse uh, um, uh, events are significantly um, higher in the transfused patients. And of course, the last question is the efficacy. Does transfusion really do the job? Does it really deliver the oxygen to the tissue? Is it taken up by the tissue, the oxygen? And you can see from this picture, it, it, it talks by itself that 42 days old blood is a different blood than fresh blood. And it simply has different rheological, uh, biochemical, chemical, and other functions or functionalities than fresh blood. So <clears throat> to sum it up, Australia said we need patient blood management instead of transfusion guidelines. We are done with transfusion guidelines. We cannot have a product and a focus of guidelines. We have to have the patient's problem in the focus. And from there, we um, develop our pathways. And transfusion might be an option for several indications, but it's not the primary solution to the, prob uh, pro uh, to the problem. And so they started with a whole series of um, uh, activities, um, de developing uh, models of care, uh, where they really implement and integrate patient blood management as a major part of good therapy. 
to make it a gold standard. Um, practitioners are involved and uh, engaged in detecting and treating anemia prior to surgery. There are workshops on uh, anemia detection, evaluation, and treatment. And this, again, this is all an overall government initiative. And we start in Australia in a country where the transfusion rate is already one of the lowest in the developed world. Um, as you can see, it was about 37 per thousand. So this was not a country where we would say, like Denmark, it's low-hanging fruit. And yet we can see the red bars are Western Australia, the blue bars are whole Australia. First time in history we reached now a transfusion level of 27 per thousand um, in this uh, Australian state. So to sum it up, if you look here at the um, bell curve and where is transfusion really given in the field of life-threatening, severe and moderate anemia, uh, the National Health Medical Research Council say um, this is where we consider transfusion to be indicated. No, more recent uh, guidelines, uh, six grams and less. And you can see the majority of these 35 million transfusions every year, red cells. I'm not only talking red cells, but we have a similar pattern for plasma and platelets is where we really, we, we, we waste resources. And um, so finally, the World Health Assembly has adopted by resolution that patient blood management must be on the agenda of not only the developed world, but also the developing world. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Maria Shander, and uh, I'd like to again thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to speak this morning. Uh, it's kind of a hard uh, act to follow, but I'm going to try to do, uh, it's hard to see you also, I feel like Madonna here with this uh, piece of equipment and uh, the lights shining and the audience looking so good. Uh, anyway, my, uh, my uh, discussion this morning is probably going to be very similar to what you heard from Axel, but I'm going to use different slides. How's that for a change? Uh, so let's talk a little bit about anemia because I thought that was what we're going to try to concentrate on. And in fact, anemia knows no borders. So even though it's a U.S. perspective, keep in mind that anemia is, is, a, uh, is an issue which we face worldwide. Uh, although we turn to uh, turn our gaze away and try to ignore anemia as a major component of health, uh, it is something wh that we have to address, I guess, uh, nation by nation, unfortunately, because of our health systems. But rather than defining anemia in terms of hemoglobin the way that WHO does, uh, these are some of uh, quotes, if you will, from different publications regarding the issue of anemia and talking about it being a lack of blood or a decrease in normal number of red cells or less than normal quantity of hemoglobin in the blood so that, again, it's not just the number of red cells but a total concentration of hemoglobin. The ability to carry oxygen is reduced, as you could see, as well as lo lack of color uh, in the individual, again, depending on the nationality. More importantly is the impact of anemia on activity, which is lack of vigor, uh, power, vitality, and energy. And that has some not only uh, health in, uh, uh, implications, but has some, uh, some social as well as economic implications. So measuring the cost of transfusion, as you saw in the previous talk, uh, may be towered, if you will, by the cost of anemia in terms of productivity. And lack of oxygen delivery to tissue is the one that, as clinicians, is our main concern when we talk about anemia. When you look at anemia from the definition of hemoglobin levels, that are dropping what we consider to be below normal. Uh, even as today, this is an older slide from 2006, but even today, if you look at the hematology literature, there's considerable debate over what is the cutoff in terms of hemoglobin for anemia. But if we use the WHO um, guidelines, as uh, Axel just showed us, I think we have a pretty good number which to start from, and then we can debate the gram or less uh, changes, as you can see on this slide. Uh, why is this important is because when we look at population studies, we do see the fact that even small decrements of hemoglobin from normal, whatever that normal is, are associated with reduced, again, survival or increased morbidity. 
Now, uh, one of the issues in terms of anemia is a classification. Not all anemia is the same. And you could see here that uh, this is data from 2005. I'm not sure what happened over the last five years that it doubled the number of uh, individuals in the world who are anemic. But as you heard Axel report, that it's close to 3 billion now that are affected by anemia. But anemia, chronic anemia versus acute anemia are two different animals, if you will, in terms of our response. And the delta hemoglobin has been associated also in terms of worse outcome, not just a drop in hemoglobin, whereas chronic anemia clearly carries some end organ damage, which may or may not be reversible depending on the individual and the type of end organ damage. The one that concerns us that we could do a lot is the perioperative anemia, as you could see on this slide, talking about the fact that we ignore many patients going for elective surgery who have low hemoglobin with the opportunity to correct that. And also the opportunity to look for underlying disease, whether it be, again, renal failure or whether it be a malignancy is ignored. But there's a larger population, which I'll show you later on, which is completely ignored, and that's the patients who walk away from the hospital who are now anemic postoperatively. Again, uh, the one that is a concern, although it's small numbers, is the acute blood loss with the ones who need to be resuscitated. And under those, those circumstances, over the years, we felt that blood is a lifesaver under those circumstances. But in fact, my argument with our trauma surgeon is if blood saved lives, we wouldn't need you. Someone has to stop the bleeding. Blood becomes a resuscitative agent under those circumstances. Now, over the years, you could see this is uh, maybe a little complex slide, but the important thing is that we, we have tolerated a reduction, if you will, of our response to anemia over the years in terms of transfusion. And 1999, which everyone keeps going back to refer to this prospective randomized controlled trial that was done in the Canadian critical care system, showing again that there was no advantage, if you will, to liberal transfusion of this population. And in fact, there was a drop in terms of hemoglobin as a threshold. But what's happened over the time is the debate around transfusion and its implication for survival. So it's not only that we've become a little more patient with lower hemoglobins, which doesn't mean we're not treating it, but we're using other modalities to treat these patients rather than transfusion because of this issue. And that arose mostly through the scandal that we had uh, in the 80s and early 90s with HIV and, of course, the bigger killer uh, from transfusion, which is hepatitis C. The other, of course, is the tolerance of this low hemoglobin. And I just want to point to the top of the slide, where as anemia becomes more severe, the, the risk of anemia is much greater, if you will, uh, in terms of other modalities of treatment, uh, including the question of transfusion. The chiasm or the point where we, we are not sure where this point is, where the risk of anemia is overshadowed by the risk of treatment whether it be ESAs or transfusion, is a point that still needs to be defined. And unfortunately, in many situations in the United States, it's being defined for us by uh, regulatory agencies rather than by science. Now, uh, I think uh, Axel has showed you this, uh, this slide just looking at the prevalence of anemia amongst uh, different populations of patients. And you could see that, again, there is a wide range of uh, anemic population. The surgical population, for example, is extremely uh, wide range, uh, as well as the HIV population. Partly this has to do with the fact that um, it is hard for clinicians, many clinicians don't even know the, the definition of anemia, if you will, in terms of hemoglobin. And two, a lot of times anemia gets ignored in discharge summaries, and a lot of these are, again, discharge, uh, discharge studies looking at the patients with and without anemia. But in fact, there is a, a significant range. Uh, this range may be due to the expression of a disease or whether it's due to anemia independently is one which is still continues to be debated. And here's one example where not all anemia w related to disease is the same because some of these anemias, again, this is cancer, if you will. This is a colorectal cancer, and you could see the Duke stages. A, a Duke a stage A versus a Duke stage D has a considerable 
range, if you will, in terms of the presence of anemia. The debate, again, goes back and forth. Is anemia just a marker of the severity or the penetrance of the disease, or does it carry independent uh, risk to the individual? While we're debating this, it really doesn't matter because, in fact, anemia is generally ignored in this population as something which is a bystander, which is innocent, if you will, as already mentioned before. I already uh, told you that uh, there is significant variability in the preoperative presentation of patients going for all types of surgery. The range is about a third to up to about half of the patients going for elective surgery in the United States are anemic by definition, which could be a harbor of underlying disease if you're from the school of thoughts that all anemia is is a representation of disease, or it could be a harbor of, again, significant negative outcomes, which I'll show you again. So again, if you will, we are uh, very poor in terms of dealing with anemia in this preoperative stage of the patients, but at the same time, we're ignoring even a larger population that leaves the hospital after surgical procedures or intervention who are anemic. And you could see that range here is about nine in 10 patients leaving the hospital. Now, I use the slide to demonstrate the fact that the, uh, depending on the etiology, hospital-induced or iatrogenic-induced anemia carries a significant risk to this population. This is a cardiac surgery population. In fact, if you look inside uh, this data of the, the iatrogenic uh, anemia produced in hospitalized patients, phlebotomy remains still a major, major cause. From the United States perspective, and I'm not sure it's any different in Europe, the number one cause for phlebotomy in the United States is sunrise for hospitalized patients. So when the sun rises in the morning, the, we send people out of the lab and they collect lots of blood from patients. And that is done routinely on a daily basis. And these, these orders for, for uh, laboratory work are called standing orders in the United States so that there'll be something to discuss. And all we discuss is the same results every day anyway from, that comes from these uh, laboratory evaluations, except one uh, laboratory uh, determ determinant, which is a uh, hemoglobin, again, which will go down as we phlebotomize these patients. Uh, some of us have called this anemia of chronic investigation. Now, um, when you look at some of the consequences of anemia, we're not talking about hemoglobins of six or 60 grams per liter, uh, whether, whether uh, they have an impact on the outcome. But again, this looks at a large uh, uh, advanced age population and looking at physical performance. Now, why is that important in this, in this population? We know from data in the United States that for every three days that an advanced, I'm not saying elderly because I'm getting there, so an advanced age individual is admitted for the hospital for every three days they're in bed, they lose one life skill function. They don't regain it back in three days. And all of you have had experiences with family members who have been admitted for hernia repair in advanced age and come out and they are completely disoriented at home or they have difficulty regaining function. So the, the implication here is that even small reductions of hemoglobin, as you could see, may end up with a significant impact, social impact, not only on the patient, but their family or the, uh, the nursing home or where they are. So there are significant implications in terms of health and, of course, in terms of cost. Now, the productivity is another issue. This, I brought this in as just, I thought, a, uh, uh, some, some uh, interesting data. This is Indonesian rubber tappers. And you could see, again, that their uh, rupees per week is, is clearly tied, if you will, in some ways, to the level of hemoglobin. We can correlate a lot of things. But this is just to bring back the cost, if you will, to society of anemia, which, again, may tower the cost of what was just mentioned in terms of transfusion. Now, um, Herzog has done a lot of work looking at large uh, Medicare populations. Uh, and again, uh, these are very easy uh, data to collect. But in fact, keep in mind that even in Medicare data, there's an underreporting of anemia because it may not be the primary 
diagnosis. And as you go down the diagnostic ladder, if you will, many things drop off. So you may come in with a, uh, an acute illness and anemia may be number 10 in terms of the listing or may just be something which is translated from the laboratory. So keep in mind that the prevalence in the Medicare population is probably, we, we think, is probably lower than what's reported. But you could see that all cause death, whether it be from CKD, congestive heart failure, or two, are again, are shadowed, if you will, by the fact that anemia is additive. Again, bringing back the argument of whether anemia is an expression of the underlying disease in terms of severity, or does it carry its own morbidity and mortality? And that will tell you that, again, our, our thinking is that anemia alone is suggestive in terms of uh, um, uh, reducing survival. Now, um, again, uh, trying to focus, if you will, on U.S. data, uh, this is National Heart and Lung and Blood Institute, uh, NMEO clinic, looking at the prevalence of anemia, showing that about 1 in 77 uh, or 1.29 percent or 35 uh, 3.5 million uh, individuals suffer from anemia across the board in the United States. But you can look at different subpopulations, if you will. So 7% of children aged to 1 and 2, and this is always uh, gets a lot more attention from the politicians when we deal with the pediatric population. But yet, so somehow, this is not resounding even uh, with this population. 12% of women age uh, 12 to 49 have anemia in the United States. Again, this is the, uh, the CDC or the National uh, Center for Health Statistics from the CDC looking at this. And about 174,000 nursing home residents had anemia in the United States. This is, again, report from the 1999-2000 uh, uh, CDC report. Now, why, why is this sort of important is because it's a large population, as you saw, that we're going to be contending with in the future. But for some reason, we ignore them because they may not have social impact being in a nursing home. In fact, we know the social impact is a lot greater but yet not well quantified today in terms of what these individuals uh, represent to society because we think of people in a nursing home as those who are going to die. Uh, in fact, they may have longevity um, longer than some of us sitting here today. Uh, 46, 27 patients died from anemia each year in the United States. Again, this is the same uh, CDC report and around 1.6 uh, people per 100,000 died from anemia each year in the United States. So they're looking at different compilations of statistics, but the fact of the matter is, regardless of the numbers, nothing as a joint venture in the United States, as you heard from the Australian government, is being done in terms of combating this disease. And it's not only ignored by us as clinicians, but it's also ignored by society. Um, when you start looking at uh, the, uh, the uh, most prevalent of diseases, if you will, uh, in the United States, a little cancer is coming up there. It was cardiac uh, disease. Uh, you could see iron deficiency anemia, and now we know from uh, just uh, uh, this past year that iron deficiency alone, not with anemia, and cardiac mortality are connected, especially with uh, a low uh, uh, ventricular activity. Uh, this is a study looking at 120 consecutive patients undergoing per percutaneous coronary intervention between 2003 and 2005, and you could see that anemia is not so silent in this population. And you're all probably familiar, if you're not, of the triad of anemia, uh, chronic kidney disease, and congestive failure, or congestive heart failure. Uh, those are as a circle in terms of the, each one of them aggravating the other and uh, becoming a vicious cycle, ending up with significant mortality. You can see that 31% of the patients enrolled had iron deficiency, whether it was anemia or not. 24 had malignancy-associated anemia, and 45% had anemia of chronic disease. The overall mortality was 12%, of which a third of those were due, again, to cardiac death. And you could see that all-cause and cardiac mortality was significantly higher in the anemic versus the non-anemic patient. Again, 
bringing back the argument with anemia is an independent marker of survival or is it just a contributory in terms of the penetrance of disease. But those of you who are familiar with that uh, vicious cycle of congestive heart failure, anemia, and chronic renal disease uh, can probably uh, um, uh, see, if you will, and appreciate the fact that anemia may have its own uh, role in terms of survival. Uh, now, uh, this is uh, another study looking at the non-cardiac surgery, and this one is a very important study done from Canada. Again, I guess uh, I'm reaching into North America, not just the USA, if you will. Uh, some of us in the U.S. feel we've conquered Canada, but th that has not happened. Uh, I, I will say that uh, uh, Scott Beatty and, and uh, his group um, uh, did this study because the non-cardiac surgery has been sort of avoided in terms of looking at it in a, uh, in a very critical manner. There, we have a lot more data in cardiac surgery than we do for non-cardiac surgery patients. And this actually, uh, I thought, was a very good study, even though it was retrospective. They looked at uh, over 7,700 uh, 7, consecutive non-cardiac surgical patients uh, at a single center between 2003 and, uh, oh, the dogs are after me, uh, uh, between uh, 2003 and 2006. Uh, Preoperative anemia was common and equal between the genders. You could see that it was significant anemia, 40% uh, in, in either arm. And after adjustment for major confounders, anemia was still associated with increased mortality. You could see the odds ratio is significant. At propensity match cohort patients, anemia was associated with increased mortality. So again, an anemia is a common condition in surgical population and independently associated with increased mortality. And again, you could see this uh, graph looking at uh, adjusted, uh, this is adjusted mortality for the two populations, anemic versus not anemic. And you could see the splaying of the mortality curves occurs very early in this population of non-cardiac patients going for surgery. The nursing home residents, again, uh, I am moving quickly here because of time, but this is a total of 451 residents from 12 nursing homes participate in the study. The average age you could see is certainly robust, 80 four years of age, a majority of a female, and you could see again that from a race point of view, man, many of the patients admitted to nursing homes in the United States are Caucasian, which again is a socioeconomic statement. Uh, unmarried, and you'd say, why would you want to look at this population in terms of marriage? Well, we do have data that as the first spouse uh, uh, perishes, the likelihood of uh, mortality, which is a confounding factor here, uh, increases. So a total of 54% of residents were anemic and 66 were treated with at least one medication, which may, could be an ACE inhibitor, which may actually aggravate anemia. Physical performance was worse in those with anemia, and those with anemia associated with a chronic kidney disease had a lower self-efficacy and outcome expectations of, for functional activity than those without uh, the presence of anemia. Again, we sort of shun away from looking at this population as having any impact or socioeconomic impact because they're in a nursing home. In fact, we need to change the way we're looking at this. You could see again uh, causes of anemia. Uh, this is the NH uh, uh, data also uh, uh, from uh, CDC looking at individuals who are 65 years of age and greater. And you could see that about a third is chronic disease. A third is nutritional or blood loss, which again is iron-restricted erythropoiesis or vitamin-restricted erythropoiesis. But the unexplained anemia uh, we think actually is explained. We don't know the mechanism, but a lot of the elderly population have a reduction in erith uh, their endogenous erythropoietic uh, uh, production. So it may be just a time before we elucidate the, um, the cause. Anemia and cancer is a major concern in the United States. These are three studies looking at this. This is 10 million people in the United States with cancer. 1.3 million cancer patients are anemic, and that is uh, determined with uh, uh, 12 grams per deciliter or less in terms of hemoglobin. The incidence of anemia can range from 20 to 60 percent in the time of diagnosis of cancer, and as high as 60 to 90 percent during their treatment, something that you're all familiar with. And anemia can have a negative impact on patients' quality of life, which the FDA does not consider as a measurable outcome. 
But for cancer patients, it's a major concern because many of them can be as productive of, as any of us uh, with, with the treatment, uh, appropriate treatment of anemia with returning to normal hemoglobins. The biggest driver for transfusions, as we all know, is again a hemoglobin level, despite all of the guidelines that say that we should incorporate other clinical findings. Anemia is still, uh, 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 low hemoglobin is still the major driver. And you could see just for anyone in the audience who doubts it, I put a big red arrow over here. And when you look at hemoglobin levels and transfusion, you could see uh, the reason I use this uh, salad of study is because there's a linear relationship between a hemoglobin level and, again, the, the, uh, the patients uh, uh, receiving transfusion. But there's another probably algorithm graph showing, again, the number of transfusion as your hemoglobin uh, goes down is increased. So there's both a dose as well as the encounter are both uh, uh, increased with a lower hemoglobin. And blood transfusions may have a risk for non-Hodgkin lymphoma. I'm going to go through these again fairly rapidly because of time, but these are newer publications from last month looking at the concern now in terms of transfusion the cancer population. Well, everyone is concerned about the use of iron as well as the use of erythropoietic stimulating agents in this population, but the measure of the risk for this population in terms of malignancy is not well documented. And here's one study showing that the overall studies combined in this analysis, the relative risk was 20% greater than those not receiving transfusion. And again, here's another one looking at um, the uh, <coughs> transfusion as subsequent risk of hemologic malignancies. And again, showing you that at every level, if you will, there is a risk. And again, these are all retrospective data and the question is, of course, the validity of the data. Keep in mind, though, that while we debate that these are retrospective rather than prospective, uh, patients may, uh, may be injured. So I don't think we can afford to ignore the fact that this may be a signal. And if the signal is there and is shown to be there, uh, we better have other modalities to address these issues other than just transfusion. So again, uh, we uh, published this uh, 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 earlier, uh, again, uh, last, uh, the, uh, last month, looking at the issue of what's happening in the United States in terms of the use of transfusions, now the national determination for uh, uh, reimbursement for ESAs has been severely restricted. And the collection of blood in the United States is going up as well as the number of transfusion, but the margin is increasing. And this is what the blood industry, if you will, is saying, is no impact of ESA restriction in the United States on transfusion. But in fact, when you look deeper into the cancer population and you now stratify this in terms of hemoglobin, you could see that there is a significant increase in transfusion depending on the level of hemoglobin. So in fact, we know that the restriction in ESA has caused a large increase in transfusion in this population, but the total U.S. blood supply has not been impacted so far uh, as, uh, as we can see at this point. Now, uh, you could see again overall the placebo versus ESAs. There is a significant, again, this is just breaking down uh, this total by hemoglobin. Now, it's very confusing for clinicians because according to CMS today, ESAs can be start, we can start treat patients at hemoglobin of 10, but we're also supposed to stop treating them at hemoglobin of 10. <coughs> Easy, right? You can see why there's enormous confusion and a lot are turning to transfusion. So I'll, I'll end by leaving you with this, uh, with this uh, commentary that we had published uh, again early this year in Transfusion looking at the issue of age of blood. So Axel did a wonderful job showing some of the pressures that we have. And some of the pressures that are there, which vary from country to country and region to region, is the blood supply. In fact, though, what we have today is there is a, a um, uh, the, the National Heart and Lung and Blood Institute has funded a large uh, prospective randomized controlled trial looking at the age of blood and its impact on all complications, if you will, including survival of patients. So while we're debating all of these data that are coming out, whether uh, the age of blood actually has an impact or not, the problem is that if we are 
right in saying that the age of blood does have an impact, the inventory and the way we manage inventory is going to be significantly, significantly affected. And at that point, whether it's 10 days or seven days, whatever the cutoff is going to be, patients who have underlying malignancy, the so-called transfusion-dependent population is going to be at risk. And that transfusion-dependent population, we need to wake up today and readdress how we manage these patients. So I'll stop here, and thank you very much for inviting me. Hope this was interesting.